Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone again. Uh, we have to uh, finish on time, there's another session uh, coming up, so uh, let's start. Uh, my name is Patrick Pavlag, I'm a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Europe, which is a think tank working on foreign and security policy issues, uh, but also on the whole set of uh, digital topics. Um, today's session is the second one hosted by the European Union linked to Declaration for the Future of the Internet. On day zero, some of you may have heard, we co-hosted with uh, the United States, Japan, and Kenya a multi-stakeholder engagement on how to translate and turn the principles of uh, the DFI into concrete actions. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with what the Declaration of the Future for the Future of the Internet is, uh, it's a document that has been endorsed by over 70 countries with the broad aim of promoting open, free, safe, secure, and interoperable internet. Some of the principles in the document include, for instance, the protecting human rights and the fundamental freedoms for all people, advancing inclusive and affordable connectivity, or promoting trust in the global digital ecosystem, including for protecting privacy. During this session, we will look for concrete recommendations towards operationalization of one of the commitments that uh, is contained in the document, and that's to cooperate to maximize the enabling effects of technology for combating climate change and protecting the environment while reducing as much as possible the environmental footprint of the internet and digital technologies. The workshop aims to provide a platform for discussion about the ways to minimize the environmental impact of the internet and digital technologies. And we're not going to solve the problem during this session. I know that there are also many other sessions happening on the topic uh, during the IGF, but we hope as well that this is going to be the beginning of the conversation, but also a call for action and the implementation of the DFI. So we would really like to identify some concrete action points and please feel free to join us um, during the discussions. Now, um, to help us meet the overall objective of the session, we have an excellent and a truly multi-stakeholder panel in the, in the room and online. So we will be switching between the panelists sitting next to me, but also uh, our esteemed speakers uh, who are already uh, online with us. Here in the room, we have uh, Pierce O'Donoghue, who is the director for the Future Networks uh, Directorate of the DigiConnect, the European Commission. Nadia Owusu, who is a youth advocate working on the intersection of technology, entrepreneurship, and climate action. And then uh, Bitangon Demo, who currently is the ambassador of Kenya to the Kingdom of Belgium and the European Union, but also has extensive experience as an academic and the permanent secretary in the Kenya's Ministry of Information and Communications. Joining us online are Sarah Walkley, who is a market researcher, writer, and advisor on sustain sustainability topics and the CEO of our organization called uh, Purposefully, Yari Carr, who is an, an, an artificial intelligence and internet governance researcher, is currently pursuing her uh, master's at the Technical University in Munich. She also coordinated with the internet, which was the national dialogue for the future of the internet in Costa Rica. Uh, also online, Michelle Thorne, who is working towards a fossil free internet, She's the Director of Strategy and Partnership for the Green Web Foundation, but previously worked um, as a co-founder, uh, sorry, and the co-founder of the Green Screen, Coalition, Green Screen Coalition for Digital Rights and Climate Justice. Uh, she served for 12 years at the Mozilla Foundation, most recently at their Sustainable Internet Lead. And finally, also online, Alexia Gonzalez Fanafalone, who is an economist and telecommunication policy analyst at the OECD, working on the whole set of issues ranging from broadband infrastructure and services, including sustainability. So even though it doesn't necessarily look like our partner is gender balanced, I ensure you that it is, and we have made an effort that uh, we bring in different perspectives uh, to the conversation. Not to lose more time, let me kick off the discussion with a question to, to you, peers. Um, the twin transition, green and digital, is one of the uh, European Union's key priorities. And I was wondering if you could tell us maybe what are, um, what is the main focus of the EU policies at the moment, and how do they contribute towards the implementation of the DFI? Which of those elements are uh, sort of critical for the conversation that we're having today? Thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, yes, indeed. Uh, not only is it a priority, but uh, green transition is one of the two key priorities of this commission under uh, President von der Leyen. The other, by the way, being digital. So the green digital transition uh, is something that we are focused on, uh, including in, in my part of the European Commission, with an ambition to lead those transitions, but also to benefit uh, to harness the benefits from it uh, for Europe and, and for society in general. We've worked over four years to support the transition to sustainability of the ICT sector, but also to maximize the contribution made by digital technologies, infrastructures and applications in, 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 in the green transition. So those are digital solutions for our, our carbon uh, targets as well. We have the Strategic Foresight Report in 2022 that told us that digital footprint is about 3% of global, of greenhouse gas emissions, about 5 to 9% of electricity consumption, and of course an ever increasing amount of e-waste. So there can be no disputing that there is a real problem caused in the sector, which has to be part of any action that we take, including with regard to the DFI. Of course, stakeholders have been taking their responsibilities. We're, we're aware of, of uh, stakeholders-led initiatives such as the Digital with Purpose, the Climate Neutral Data Centers Pact, and the Circular Electronic Partnership. And that's just a few of them. And I know that others are probably represented uh, in this meeting this afternoon. Some have made some progress, but more needs to be done to drive the ICT sector to net zero both in terms of its uh, energy consumption, but also, of course, the efforts that it is making with regard to materials and waste. And that means that all the ICT sector players need to invest in designing and deploying digital solutions that will keep GHGs, greenhouse gases, in check, and also increase the durability and circularity of, of digital devices and uh, equipment. And we feel our role as a regulator it's not necessary to regulate that up front, but to make sure that those partners in industry who do engage uh, proactively and responsibly in such activities are rewarded, or certainly at least that they are not punished and undercut by those with a less scrupulous approach who will cut costs at, uh, um, at, at the disadvantage of the environment in order simply to, to sell product. So that responsibility is in relation to the footprint. But also, of course, we have specific sectors where there are um, particular climate uh, challenges or, or, or critical issues in energy, in transport, in construction, uh, and of course in agriculture, where all of them are f finding difficult to meet sustainability goals. And we know that digital solutions have the potential to cut about 15% of total emissions by 2030. And, and one of the things that we're doing in the European Union, including I have a team, for example, working on Internet of Things in application sectors, and it is our responsibility to, to mainstream the, uh, the, the work on green by design, on the digital requirements in order to ensure that any solution in those sectors is itself contributing to our objectives, but more importantly is driving, for example, energy efficiency, in transport, in logistics, and so on. We have last year issued the Digitalization of Energy System Action Plan, which is working with our colleagues working on energy policy and energy technologies, just to set out a set of actions with regard to decarbonizing the energy network, making the energy network much more efficient by using digital technology, by incorporating things such as uh, the el electrical vehicle infrastructure so that the batteries in the vehicles become part of the energy grid, so that there is intelligent charging and reuse of the energy that is, is downloaded. Uh, also, it works on grid optimization, uh, predictive uh, energy uh, production, and so on. Of course, even there, we have to be realistic that not all digitalization efforts have a, have a positive impact. And we have to see to it that we are aware of the impact uh, and that we're delivering positive impact by measuring the impact of ICTs and the net value that they provide in terms of our uh, decarbonization goals. 
to do that, we have also launched another initiative, which is the European Green Digital Coalition. When I say launched, we, we sponsored it in part, but it comes from the voluntary action and now independent existence of this network of 40 companies who have committed to making their companies individually best in class with regard to digital efforts, decarbonization, and also contributing to the uh, digitalization of uh, energy consum consuming sectors. So the European Green Digital Coalition, which is led by JESI, uh, as well as ETNO, Digital Europe, Digital SME Alliance, and GSMA. So a lot of actors who are known in their own right uh, in, in Europe uh, are, are all working together on this. And um, we're looking forward to, to having more progress as they also recruit further companies, but also that they work closely with other actors, uh, particularly in civil society, uh, and uh, academia, uh, the scientific and academic community, so the stakeholders that we're always gathering here in the IGF, in order to ensure that the science is right, that there is independent aid, but also audit and verification by those communities with regard to how concrete is the contribution of industry, uh, and what are the societal requirements, what could be some of the negative consequences if we do not analyze and tailor make the, uh, the efforts that we're making. For example, it is easy to say to everybody that they must buy the latest, most energy efficient piece of consumer equipment, but that is not a proposition for many, many persons in society. There have to be other steps that have to be taken as well. So this is why the rounded view, even though, as I've, you've heard me say, we're putting a lot of pressure and emphasis on the role of industry, the rounded view of these uh, efforts, particularly in the context of the DFI, needs that stakeholder involvement. All sectors of society need to, to, to play a role so that we get it right. And in, if we do that, then we have a formula for um, having the, the twin transition, that's the digital and green transitions, deliver benefits to all of the aspects of sustainability, economic sustainability, but of course social sustainability as well naturally as environmental sustainability. Uh, and that's something that's underlined in our digital decade policy program uh, and also actually in our declaration of digital rights and principles where once again uh, environmental, con environmental considerations need to be put to the centre of our policy work. Uh, and finally, just let me come back to the point about um, digital transition, how it realises its full potential. It's not just about supporting the green transition, but how about the green transition can support digitalisation targets. So for example, the move to renewable energy uh, and how we uh, make that digital, but then help it to, to actually um, give a positive outcome for digital technologies, is, uh, it's a bit of a conundrum, uh, but it is nevertheless one which we know can uh, give great benefits. Uh, better integrated digitalization in the environmental and climate policies will also bear fruit, uh, and uh, the provision of green digital solutions in climate critical sectors, su such as those that I've mentioned, will actually be a way also of having a positive impact on the environment for those more vulnerable geographies and societies uh, who otherwise have or will suffer disproportionately from uh, global warming. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Piers. I think um, you've highlighted a, a lot of interesting points, but I think what I uh, what I really liked is this focus on grid by design that they use pursuing as well, that exactly is part of the solution, but uh, also stressing the importance of um, this almost whole of society approach, if you want, to thinking about how on one hand technology indeed is a problem that we have to address, but at the same time part of the solution that we have to discuss. Uh, and I know that speakers, uh, both online and here in the room, are going to talk about that. Speaking of our speakers online, let me turn to um, two of them who are uh, joining us. And I'd like to bo ask both uh, Sarah Walkley and Michelle Thorne the same question. Um, what are some of the key challenges, but also opportunities, um, in reconciling growth and digital economy 
and green digital transition that you see uh, from the perspective of your organizations and which ones do you consider the priority? Following up on what Pierce said about the multi-stakeholder community engagement, how can this community foster open, transparent, and inclusive dialogue between different groups to identify good practices, but also uh, some innovative solutions to address this problem. And uh, maybe we could start with uh, Sarah, please. Thanks, Patrick. So, yeah, um, I work with a number of small and medium-sized businesses, um, advising them. and. My experience is that the impact of digital technology is really poorly understood within that group. Um, relative to other sources of emissions, of added footprint is quite small, but it's one of the areas where emissions are growing quite intensively due to um, how much data we're storing and our use of some of these models. My background before going freelance was in um, print publishing. And within that sort of area, the minute we had got rid of our print books, magazines, and so on, there was a, a, an expectation that that was job done for the organisation in terms of sustainability, because we'd got rid of the, the physical product. Um, and so it's that sort of lack of um, yeah, the intangible nature of, of a lot of the digital services that um, means that businesses struggle to see the impact of their, their digital habits on the environment. And equally, because at the individual level, those impacts could be quite small. Yeah. Email collectively is estimated to account for 0.3% of global emissions, but each individual um, email is yeah, a gram or two um, and also those impacts the, the collective impact happens upstream in the data services and the energy that that's used and so it's kind of from, from a business perspective it feels really quite remote from day-to-day -day operations um, and so many of the SMEs I speak to say they don't you know, because their employees work remotely and everything they do is online they don't really need to have a sustainability strategy um, so, from my point of view, there's a significant need for education, um, especially to help businesses um, think about the energy, you know, who they choose as their hosting providers and looking at what energy they have, perhaps how they code their products to, to make them um, smaller and more efficiently, to use more efficient code. Um, and I'm a great believer in looking at co-benefits and so perhaps how we use policies in other areas to sort of leverage what uh, good um, sustainable practice so encouraging marketers to clear up the data that they've stored which is good practice from a GDR perspective also helps reduce the amount of data we store and the energy we're using. And so thinking about so how we can leverage some of those existing policies and connect issues in people's mind um, could be useful. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, one, uh, so your intervention triggered, uh, you know, one of the thoughts I had at some point, you know, how we got used right now to including this disclaimer in the emails, think if you really have to print this email, uh, something that probably might be a good practice is also think if you have to respond to this email to reduce the uh, effort, I'm sure a lot of people in the room would also appreciate the practical aspect of it, where if we didn't really have to respond or see that many of them in our mailboxes. Um, and Michelle, over to you with the same question some of the good practices, challenges you see, but also how cooperation between different stakeholder groups can be part of uh, the solution. Yeah, and thank you so much, Patrick, for convening this panel, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all virtually at the IGF. Um, yeah, one at the Green Web Foundation, one of the focuses we have is talking about how uh, the majority of internet infrastructure is actually um, powered by fossil fuels. And one of the things we need to do to focus on transitioning those infrastructures off of fossil fuels. 
um, it has been mentioned in the, um, the or by the earlier speakers, we see the electricity demands for general computing rising, but especially for AI. And as we talk about these twin transitions, we actually aren't talking in a more um, detailed way about how those energy demands will be matched in a sustainable way um, as we increase that digitization. And also in these conversations to expand beyond just talking about the carbon impacts, but there's land and water usage, noise pollution, um, strains on the critical raw materials. These are really um, holistic um, and multifaceted systems that we're talking about. Um, and so one of the, I guess, points to stress or um, opportunities here is how can we actually have a data informed conversation about where and how these internet infrastructures are built and where they placed and where they maintained. Um, right now we talked about where, where are the civil society actors and where are the impacted communities when something like a data center is being built. We've seen at least in the European context, but also in the South American context and other places, um, you know, communities pushing back and saying, you're building a data center in our community that's, for example, running on 100% renewables as an example from a Dutch uh, community recently. And now that this huge data center is being built, our community has to shift to um, relying on fossil fuels. These kinds of conversations aren't happening in a way that is allowing the communities to be fully empowered in the decision of how those infrastructures are being deployed and built and who's getting prioritized in terms of resourcing. So this also a democratic uh, a question of uh, democratic involvement. Um, where I see policymakers having a role to play is in actually helping to be to create the data, the public evidence base so that these data informed conversations can happen. That includes, for example, more transparency and accountability on reporting of environmental impacts, um, digital technologies, especially around scope three emissions. We know this, is, this has been an issue <laughs> long identified, but still um, lacking in follow through to really talk about the digital supply chain and to make credible reporting um, around that. Um, we also really need to see a more credible net zero targets um, from tech companies. If we look at the, the companies who are majorly responsible for internet infrastructure and digital services, um, most of them don't have interim or credible interim net zero targets. And many of them actually are performing worse than fossil fuel companies in terms of transparency. So this is a place again, where if we're talking about the powers of digitization and the positive impacts within the digitization, we also need to see those net zero targets um, published and being committed to and followed through. Um, and also then speaking again at a policy level, again, we're based in the EU, so have maybe more a stronger lens in the EU context, but recently the EU had the energy efficiency directive. And um, instead of uh, holding on to wins that we had around reporting, for example, of data centers that are using electricity roughly this um, at the level of 300 households, there was lobbying um, and, that, and the threshold was changed. So that data centers that are working at the level of 15,000 households have to start reporting. So why are we having this shift when we're saying we need actually more information on both the um, uh, energy consumption of the digital sector, but then saying we actually don't need to be reporting on data centers that still are using quite significant um, resources. So this is again a part of that holistic um, conversation we need to have. We need to have the information around what are those impacts, who's being held to account, and who's at the table deciding where and how those resources are being allocated. Um, so, <laughs> go ahead. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, we might come back to some of these points. You talked a lot about accountability and transparency. I also wonder to what extent these issues, for instance, when, they, when there is a, such an impact on local communities becomes an issue for local, regional, national elections, for instance, maybe something we totally. uh, uh, we want to come back to later on. Um, let me bring the conversation back to the room. Uh, I'll uh, switch to you, Nadia, right now, if you don't mind. Um, I mean, youth, we know, has a particular stake in this conversation, both as a user of digital technologies, but also, frankly, um, the part of our societies that really have to deal with the consequences of the policy decisions uh, that are taken uh, today. So both really as uh, the target of the policies, but also the consumer of the digital technologies. Uh, from your perspective, um, how can the governments um, and the private sector or um, youth organizations work better together uh, with uh, youth organizations as well like your own. Um, and what are some of the actions that you would recommend 
your peace can take to also reduce the uh, digital footprint uh, on the environment. All right, thanks so much, Patrick, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Nadia Usu. I'm from Ghana. For me, I would like to talk about um, governments and private sectors, especially private sectors that are more interested in um, away from greenwashing, but actually participating in ensuring this more sustainability, how they can work with young people, especially young people from the continent, especially Africa, where we are at the brands and facing climate change every day. We feel that if governments, private sectors, and civil societies and youth organizations come together and see young people, not as just a stakeholder, but also as partners, they can take on our concerns and work better with us in this few approaches I'm about to mention. I think um, Piers mentioned multi-stakeholder um, consultation. I think that is very important, but we need more engagement for young people. I believe young people should be actively engaged in policy discussions. We need more young people in the room when decision making that have to deal with us are in discussions. According to the ITU last um, 2022, about 70, 75% of people online are young people be between the ages of 15 to 24. So if we have this much, um, um, volume of young people online, then we need to be part of engagement, we need to be part of consultations, and these have to happen in different levels, from regional levels to local levels to international levels, where each and every region's needs are met on that need-to-need -need base basis. And I also want to talk about youth representation, just like I mentioned, we need to appoint young representatives, advisors to government committees, to boards, to industries and associations that can ensure that young people's perspectives are integrated in decision making. I also want to mention the fact that Sarah talked about education. How many people know about the DFI? How many people know the signatories? How many countries are part of the um, parties? How many countries are, have been um, being part of this DFI. We need more um, education, we need more awareness creation, and we need to implement educational programs that raise awareness on the importance of you know, a free digital ecosystem, which is also sustainable for young people to thrive e effectively. I also want to talk about the fact that um, the governments should support innovations for young people. Young people are creative, young people are innovative, young people are challenging the status quo every day and they are bringing up new innovations. I believe with support, um, they can, the government and private stakeholders can invest in programs that support you entrepreneurship and climate action, specifically on renewable and circular economies and energies. We can also push for more digital skills development for young people, especially on the continent, by providing grants, mentorship, resources to encourage more young people to start their own businesses to drive innovations at different levels. When we're talking about digital technologies, it also affects climate change, and we want to push for more climate and sustainable ways young people can do this by addressing environmental concerns, by involving young people in decisions and initiatives related to climate change and sustainability. I would also want to talk about the fact that collaboration is very key. We should push for more collaboration between governments, private stakeholders, and also youth-led initiatives to tackle challenges and create opportunities for young people to thrive effectively. But we cannot ask for putting young people on the table, giving young people opportunities, creation of awareness without talking about mechanisms to monitor um, the progress of these things. So we, I think it's important that we establish mechanisms for feedback evaluations to assess the effectiveness of policies that relate to young people when it comes to the DFI and also digital technologies aimed at addressing young people's concerns. These would make um, positive adjustments based on feedback. We need to have um, proper ways of collection of data that are reflective of the needs of young people, especially when it comes to um, the digital economy. The last thing I would want to talk about too is um, a sustainable long-term perspectives. We have discussions, we have conversations, we want youth um, perspective, we want youth insights, but how sustainable would these be for, long, for the long term? How would these policies and investments benefit future generations considering the impacts of young people's lives and their potentials to contributions to the society? In terms of what young people can do to you know, reduce their digital footprint, I think uh, we mentioned a few, like the emails, having um, people not to print, but I think what's more integral is for young people to know that they can advocate for green tech, they can push for and encourage tech companies and policy makers to adopt eco-friendly practices and invest in renewable energy sources. They can also, um, you know, um, 
participate in e-waste recycling, recycling their electronics by responsibly um, recycle all the electronics rather than throwing them away in trash. These also go away to, you know, pollute the environment and add up to more of the um, greenhouse gases. They should also use energy efficient devices. They should choose to push for more um, sustainable and energy efficient laptops, smartphones, and other devices. Um, the, the, the point is about the energy star rated products and also sustainable softwares and also um, push for um, education and awareness for their peers. But the simple things people can do on a day-to-day -day basis is simple, by using public Wi-Fi than rather using their own internet, um, by turning off unused devices while charging them. They can unplug charges. They can also um, participate in their digital cleanup, erasing of emails, um, cleaning their junk, deleting unnecessary files they have on their devices, which would add up to all of these things. They can also think of um, limiting their streaming time because the more they stream videos and online contents, the more of amounts of energy and bandwidth they use. So they should rather push for downloading things offline and watching them rather than streaming. They should also um, practice digital minimalism, which is by using um, your online presence and reducing online presence, deleting unused accounts. People have up to three to four accounts, but if we practice more digital minimalism, we can have um, a reduced um, digital presence for people. And I would like to also mention the fact that if each and every day uh, we take these little conscious steps to reduce our digital footprint, we get a more sustainable environment, a more sustainable future, a more sustainable environment where everybody can live cohesively and push for a more digital space. So thank you so much, Patrick. Great, thank you. Um, you put a lot of... Um habit-changing issues on the table that we can potentially all adopt. And uh, I want to maybe come back, if we have time for the discussion, to both um, Sarah and Michelle to discuss with you to what extent you see the impact of those, um, of those uh, changed habits uh, in, on the bigger picture. And you also brought to the conversation uh, another aspect. We, we talked a bit about industrial policy and the regulation, what can be done. Uh, I think it's pretty clear as well that we have to look at other policy areas, like education, for instance, uh, or consumer policies that sort of impact um, those practices at the large scale. Um, Speaking about the governments as well and how they can engage younger generations, Ambassador, you have um, had multiple roles as an academic. You looked at the topic as an academic, uh, as a government representative, and now you actually have a chance to impact how the policies are made, including uh, those of the European Union. And I wonder from your perspective, um, A, how do you think the governments can actually work with other stakeholder groups, how you have tried to do this as a, as a government official in Kenya. But also, what do you see some of uh, the key challenges? Uh, Nadia mentioned Africa, which is a continent that's very much impacted by the climate change. To what extent this has been one of the uh, dimensions in your thinking about how the ecosystem or the policies uh, of the Kenyan ICT are, uh, are shaped? Thank you. I think much has been said. Uh, but what I want to add is that uh, what uh, should government be doing and taking advantage of the position in which like Africa is in at the moment, we have a lot of sunshine. Uh, we have a lot of uh, geothermal deposits. We have a lot of uh, rivers which are huge uh, to produce green energy. Uh, we need to leverage that Kenya it itself had a strategy for green energy even before we started to discuss this. So much of our energy comes from geothermal um, and uh, wind and also uh, from hydro, uh, where 94% actually of our energy is, is green. Uh, but that doesn't stop us from changing behavior like my sister was talking about here. Um, COVID taught us that uh, we can do a lot online. Uh, we've been doing conferences, we've been teaching online. We've been less travel means uh, we have removed a few carbons out of, out of the space. Um, if governments have proper strategies to take advantage of that 
which can be done to reduce carbon emissions, let it be done. I know, for example, uh, we did a document for the government recently. Um, there are uh, places where if we begin farming there, uh, what happens there is uh, carbon uh, sequestration. I mean, new method, generative agriculture, which would create more, uh, remove more carbon from the air. That's what I mean that government strategies could do more uh, and and involve young people in in every aspect of it. In terms of what everybody has said, education is very key to create awareness. Um, even some even though sometimes people don't um, d don't take it very seriously, if you say it too much uh, of it. Um, also, if we can lengthen the use of some of the devices that we have by recycling them or by using them in other ways. Uh, for example, most of the computers we use in the city, sometimes we donate them to kids to use, um, meaning that we lengthen that uh, part of, uh, of the equipment instead of throwing it away and, 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 and increasing, um, increasing uh, carbon emissions or waste or um, climate. Um, there are some, several other things that government can do it in itself uh, by finding ways of discussing with the civil society to promote what we are talking about, multi-stakeholder. Uh, more often than not, um, when governments make policy, they in most countries, there is friction between uh, civil society and government, and, and then you end up making policies that don't support um, the current state in which we are working in. Uh, but by working with them, you, you realize that uh, there are so many things. Yesterday I said, um, initially I was just like any government bureaucrat, but after, uh, a few discussions with the civil society, with um, other groups, I found them very helpful uh, to work with. Uh, politicians, uh, especially parliament, those who pass legislation, um, we need to monitor them closely because um, the truth is that the private sector uh, has some leeway, but we we are not supposed to speak about that in, in the sense that they can, they can, through lobbying, make some laws not be good for the environment. Uh, it is good to say that, mm -hmm. because I know there are private sector here that they usually have a way uh, of doing things um, which uh, needs to be looked at and done correctly. Um, so, uh, because every, everything has been said, uh, I, think, uh, I think that will do. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I remember um, I met one of your colleagues uh, from Kenya um, a few years ago when we had the discussion about, she works on cybersecurity, so we had a broader discussion about cyber, but there was one very interesting example that she, uh, that she has mentioned. Using the EU's uh, reference to human-centric approach, she, she said, you know, why do we talk about human-centric approach and not life-centric approach, for instance, when we talk about the investment in uh, the infrastructure, she gave this very interesting example of how, for instance, sequencing of policies, if it's better coordinated and implementation of different projects, can actually have a very positive impact. Uh, and gave the example of the road that has been built that, of course, caused a certain environmental damage uh, in, the uh, in the communities, but then that road had to be destroyed in order to put the fiber optic cables. And she said, you know, we basically had to uh, do this destruction twice, and by coordinating policies, we could have avoided some of this. So I think there is, uh, there is some um, interesting lessons to be learned there. But let me move, let me move now to uh, one of our speakers online, Alexia, who works for OECD. And uh, Alexia, I would like to hear your thoughts on 
what strategies and frameworks can be also implemented to uh, ensure that the deployment of digital technologies is supporting this objective of green digital transition takes the environmental considerations on board. Uh, it's a topic that is very often presented as a, as a new one, but uh, you and I, as we've discussed, it's definitely not something that is new uh, in the policy discussions, including at the OECD. So I would like to hear your thoughts on where you see the state of the conversations is right now and what some of the um, lessons, maybe, or observations that have been already made in the past could, uh, could be useful for the discussions that we're having today. Alexei, over to you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, everybody hears me okay? Yes? <laughs> Yes, okay, so thank you very much. When we talk about the twin transitions, so we're talking about what is the role of digital technologies and the enabling infrastructure to leverage the opportunities to achieve these uh, green or environmental sustainable goals. And here's some key questions is one, in this intersection of technology, both the development and the diffusion and policy and our environment, how do we measure the impact of digital and green? And this is important because only what can be measured can be improved. And th at the moment, there is a lack of harmonization on, on this metrics, also at the private where the ESG reporting and at, and at the public level. And also in this road, what are the main policy considerations for a coherent whole of government and multi-stakeholder approach? We heard the, the importance about a multi-stakeholder approach. If we look at OECD countries, and we look at communication regulators, for example, half of them have partial mandates on environmental sustainability of communication networks, but only a fifth have a direct mandate, which means that really leveraging digital technologies for environmental sustainability goals requires a whole of government approach and a multi-stakeholder approach. We know as well, as was mentioned by our, our, the predecessors, is how digital technologies themselves have an environmental footprint all across their life cycle. And so this is also important to, to harness. So why, why is this conversation, as Patrick said, not, not entirely new? So let's look at the road behind to see what is the road ahead. And at the OECD, this intersection of digital and green was first explored in the work leading to the OECD recommendation of ICTs on the environment. This recommendations, council recommendation of 2010. And it had several principles that we're currently reviewing the relevance and see if we have to update it. But one of them is coordinating um, ICTs for climate and environment and energy po policies. And here it recommends to look both at the direct effects of ICTs, the enabling effects in other sectors, and third, the systemic effects that require social change and cultural behavior uh, change that was rightfully mentioned. So um, here we see that these, these Three effects can be mapped, for example, on the scope one, scope two, scope three of the greenhouse gas protocols. Now, we also seen that we have a, a, a council recommendation on broadband connectivity uh, that was from 2004, renewed in 2021, and it urges stakeholders to minimize the negative effects of communication networks on the environment, also promoting smart networks and devices. And I, I will just pause here a little bit with some nuggets of information of connectivity, which is the underlining um, foundational pillar of digital transformation and, and how it can be leveraged to achieve these, these green objectives. We've seen in recent years a boost for fiber deployment in many OECD countries. And this transition to fiber is, is seen by, by some stakeholders as also achieving environmental sustainability goals as it's more energy efficient than, than copper alternatives. We've seen also the, the increase of AI systems uh, to, for example, optimize energy management of communication networks. We've seen talks about the standardization and the development of 6G where key values such as environmental sustainability are being embedded. But um, when we talk about AI, and here the OECD did the first uh, standard on AI principles in 2019, there's a clear focus on the importance of the, the environmental sustainability of it. And you, the presentation note that you provided, Patrick said all of the positive effects of AI, we have a dedicated expert group on AI compute and climate looking at both negative and positive effects. And particularly when we talk about 
the negative effects and data center consumption on all of that. It, it, the conversation requires a bit more nuance because there's a difference between the training of AI models and the inference of these models. So pre precise measurement on this particular aspect requires a lot more legwork going ahead. So if, if I would say some key messages that, that might, you know, are important to, to remember is also the enabling effects of ICTs on other sectors of the economy. It was mentioned both by uh, peers and others of the impact of IoT, uh, green by design, and, and having this, uh, for example, for smart agriculture, for precision agriculture, for reducing congestion in cities, and for energy grid use. Um, for he, I have a little data point that I would like to share with you on data centers and energy. Um, so we have the International Energy Agency, IEA, and the, and the IEA esteems that at least half of the global reductions on CO2 emissions required for a net zero scenario by two, 2050 rely on clean energy technology developments that are still in their prototype phase. So there's an importance of innovation, but there's also an importance of technology diffusion. And when we look at digital, so there is a rising demand of digital services over the past decade. For example, since 2010 to 2020, the number of internet users doubled and global internet traffic expanded 15 fold, 15, uh, fold. but there have also been rapid advances in energy efficiencies thanks to to digitalization. And we've seen that the, uh, they, what it would be data centers and data transmission networks during that same period have been relatively stable at 1% of global electricity use. So this really, you know, it's important to, to, to realize that innovation, we have to really push for that and also how digitalization can be leveraged for green objectives, but it, it requires technological diffusion. Now, finally, I'll leave you with three key messages that one, common measurement standards are required and we need more data collection to track the environmental impacts of digital technologies, both the direct and the enabling effects, and of course, the systemic ones that require behavioral use. Secondly, we need to go beyond energy and resource efficiency to talk about systemic effects, go beyond uh, greenhouse gas emissions because there are other several planetary boundaries that are in danger, such as biodiversity, ocean acidification, biochemical flows, air pollution. And third, efforts towards environmental equity and transparency are needed for inclusive growth and development. And this could be enabled notably by, by harnessing digital for green, but we should remember that while green transition class has a clear focus and determination, the digital transition is not deterministic. It needs to be directed in a positive way for society and the environment. And that's where the human-centric approach recovers a lot of relevance. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much, Alex. I, I think you also have uh, touched upon an interesting point that we have discussed yesterday, not only in relation to green, but um, the whole DFI in general. Um, when we talked about which of the um, principles of the DFI could be prioritized, the issue of connectivity seemed like one where a lot of governments actually were paying attention. Uh, and there's a very clear connection with, with your intervention where exactly thinking about connectivity in the context of the principle about the grid transition, but also others in the, uh, in the DFI, we may create these um, this interlinkages between uh, different principles and potentially uh, use them to enable each other. So that's, um, th that's a great point as well. Um, in general, listening to the discussions, uh, I feel like I'm very happy that this is also being recorded and I have a chance to uh, rewatch it afterwards because there is a lot of data coming from all the speakers uh, that I do not manage to note myself. So, uh, and, and I'm sure that uh, people in the room and online are in a similar situation. So thank you IGF again for uh, recording the sessions which will give us the opportunity to review this. Um, I'd like to go to our uh, final speaker online, uh, Yari Karr, who is at the Technical University in Munich, but originally from um, Costa Rica, and who I know has done some work on new technologies, um, especially use of uh, AI systems and so on. And I was wondering, Yavli, you could, if you could tell us how exactly new technologies could be used to, um, to address some of the uh, 
impacts that the climate change, might, sorry, that the digital transition might have on uh, on climate and environment more broadly. So, uh, Yavri, over to you for for your thoughts. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can uh, hear me. Um, thank you very much for the invitation in this session. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Um, well, as a digital youth envoy from the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, today I want to share with you the transformative role that artificial intelligence can play in shaping a sustainable future, and importantly, how our youth can also actively engage in this mission, well, adding to what already Nadia mentioned. So um, let's begin by exploring some remarkable AI applications that are catalyzing positive change uh, in this uh, fight, fight against climate change, and that we're also part of the AI for Good Summit from the ITU in last July. So um, from AI-driven climate prediction and disaster response to optimizing green energy and revolutionizing agriculture, there are innovations reshaping our approach to sustainability. They offer us the tools to monitor and protect our environment in ways we could only dream some years ago. For example, um, there are now uh, technologies that, that are being developed, for example, using AI to make cities safe, clean, and sustainable, developing a, um, a, um, to AI tools capable of providing information on where, when, and what disaster or climate change event may occur in the future, uh, facilitating acting before the disaster happens, something that before could not be um, done. And this helps mitigate our or even avoid a negative environmental impact that the event will have on the area. Also taking into consideration that some regions in the world, um, for example, in Latin America, are very impacted um, because of disasters and that people is normally not uh, well prepared or that are maybe living in a difficult or risky area. So this is also very important for that. Um, another, plat uh, another platform, for example, uses machine learning algorithms based on more than 7 billion lines of weather and ground truth data. And uh, this could help uh, preventing uh, fires, for example. So they predict where wildfires uh, could be um, emerging. And um, yeah, and they also, like, for example, have uh, been detecting this in risk areas. And also the, predi the prediction of deforestation. And this could be done using satellite imagery that makes possible to analyze the potential of deforestation based on information such as the distance to water resource sources, cities, and other key factors. So these AI applications are not just technological marvels. They represent now a frontier of possibilities. And they, show they showcase how cooperation between technology and environmental stewardship can pave the way for a more sustainable and resilient future. And um, I consider that also um, empowering youth with knowledge and also the population in general is very important. Um, adding to what Nadia said, um, I consider that it's clear that education is our first line of defense as well. We must keep our youth with the knowledge and skills needed to understand, harness, and further develop the technologies in a responsible way. Um, I consider that um, informatics and AI education should be seamlessly integrated in, into school curricula, but also open education and open science, um, as well as online platforms that offer accessible resources for learning about AI and sustainability should be um, available for everyone. Um, workshops and awareness programs can bridge the knowledge gap, fostering a generation that not only understands the technology, but is also inspired to leverage for positive change. And a uh, Along with that education, I also consider youth-led innovation um, could also be a very important option um, because knowledge is, is not enough uh, in today's society. So we must, we must uh, also empower youth to be innovators, problem solvers, and also architects of change. Um, so imagine the impact of global hackathons and innovation challenges that bring young minds together uh, to tackle environmental challenges um, think about also the potential of youth-led te uh, technology hubs where ideas are transformed into tangible solutions and also mentorship programs that um, are um, organized by experts with more, uh, much more experience or that, are, uh, that have expertises in different areas of science that could also uh, contribute to these uh, youth to um, move forward with their innovations and also with um, 
with their spirit of innovation and also creating a fertile ground for sustainable ideas to blossom. So, um, yeah, and also remembering that this kind of um, education and innovation should also come into regions and areas that are um, normally historically discriminated, such as populations of African descended indigenous or uh, populations that have um, difficult access to uh, resources. So thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Jeffrey. We have about five minutes left. I would like to check if anybody in the room would uh, like to intervene, make a comment on what you have heard, or maybe show your perspectives in the discussion. I mean, oh, there, there are reactions, great. So we have two reactions. If you, if you don't mind, uh, online, I'm going to take these two comments uh, from the room and then maybe go to uh, those speakers who are interested for 30 seconds of uh, final thoughts. Uh, we go over to you first. Hi everyone, I am Denise Leal from Brazil. So it's a Latin America perspective that I bring to the table. Uh, it was very interesting hearing all of you and what you've uh, highlighted very important aspects and points on the green digital era. So, but I, I keep like Michelle has is spoken about transparency and the reports, and I think that this is a very important point on the theme. And I also have uh, noted here about when Alexia told about biodiversity, it really interested me. But and I kept thinking. Um, we are speaking about how the technology and internet can help uh, to keep the green era, like the uh, environmental safe, but also I, I was thinking, and when we have legal disputes on digital and internet and technology and also the uh, environment, mm -hmm. can the environment be seen as a right holder and in your countries? Are there legal disputes on the team? And how do they end? Because uh, I am with a group making a research in Brasilia University, and we have studied about these legal disputes, and they usually don't end well. We have the laws and the regulations, and the reality is it's really beautiful. The environment is protected. But when it comes to the decisions made on the legal disputes, actually, uh, not always we can see uh, protection for the environment in not only in Brazil, but also international disputes. Mm -hmm. We can see that. So I wanted to hear from you. How do you see this point? And if you have I studied it in any time, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Great question. Uh, over to you. And then I know also Michelle online has um, a very targeted question for peers, so uh, we'll go to you, Michelle, as well. Uh, please, here. Um, thank you. My name is uh, Bushri Body, and um, I had a few um, questions that are all interrelated to each other. So um, I think various speakers spoke about, um, you know, decarbonization and um, carbon sequ uh, sequestration as some of the um, measures that we are using to um, mitigate climate change and especially in the technology area. Um, but I also then question maybe um, the general frameworks or the policies, especially in the European context, whether it's the Commission or the Councils um, are advancing that um, really emphasize achieving carbon neutrality um, within a certain time frame. Um, not being realistic um, or in cohesion with like the IPCC um, findings, um, especially with how rapidly we're seeing climate change, change affect different communities. Um, and then using those measures that actually maybe hide some of the wider impacts. Like when we talk about the entire life cycle approach, well, the extraction of nat natural resources that are happening in different contract, uh, contexts with human rights violations, are those being considered in the ca carbon footprinting measures or the benchmarking that's happening? It feels like there's a lot of, um, let's export some of our impacts to other um, areas or regions of the wor world in the same way that our technologies are being exported that have these negative um, implications. And I think, um, the other question that I have that's connected to this is, 
the assumption that we have that um, the collection of data is needed and is actually necessary for these um, sustainable transitions that we're talking about when in fact now data centers surpass um, the air, entire airline industry in terms of CO2 emissions. Um, we've been pushing a lot for big data policies um, across, I mean, the European context, but around the world. And most of the data that's collected isn't being used, can't actually be analyzed. Um, and so I think that assumption needs to be challenged. Like, why are we collecting this data in the first place when it is having tangible negative environmental impacts, but also societal impacts? So for already marginalized communities, including migrants and forcibly displaced persons, that data is being used to prevent them from seeking asylum. Um, in the European context, for example, but also um, across the Americas and around the world. Um, so just, I wanted to get a sense of how you're trying to find some cohesion between some of these policies that don't seem to actually be rooted in the evidence, and then this need to collect more evidence to do what's already known to be the, the best practice mm -hmm. um, in these cases, kind of like um, pushing the, um, you know, the, the thing down the road when in reality we could be addressing these issues today. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm being told that we have to end. Uh, Michelle, uh, if your question can uh, be formed in 30 seconds, so that then I also give uh, peers 30 seconds to answer and the ambassador to react, that would be great. We have apologies to the organizers for stealing two minutes. Uh, Michelle, over to you. Sure. Um, so I'm wondering how digital innovation can be done so that it doesn't further consolidate the market power of existing companies, but it's creating economic opportunity for and benefits of the most impacted people in areas. So we don't have a brittle monoculture online, but rather a diverse and open ecosystem. Great, perfect, thank you. That was less than 30 seconds, much appreciated. Um, Ambassador, I'll start with you for 30 seconds, final thoughts, and then I'll go uh, here on the table, whoever would like to take the floor. I, I would have taken much longer to talk about uh, sequestration of carbon uh, this came from the side of IT in some sections of Kenya and by use of uh, trying to do uh, precision farming and found that uh, we could actually sequestrate carbon and contribute heavily into this. I, I don't know whether that's sufficient or I need to continue or <laughs> we can follow up. You can discuss this over coffee. Uh, there's this very important question about does the environment have the rights, which I think we will also have to take offline, unfortunately. Nadia, do you have in the reaction 30 seconds? Sure. Um, I really wanted to say that I totally agree with everything the panel said, especially those online when it comes to youth involvement in this entire conversation on digitalization and green economy. So I want to say after this conversation, we have to keep it going. There are more conversations at the UNFCC Climate Change Conference that is at COP28 in Dubai. We can have such conversations. So I'm saying we carry these conversations away from IGF to climate change conferences where we have more stakeholders in the climate change networks. Thank you. Well, I was going to make a, a, a comment, but I won't. I will just make an observation and say I learned a lesson. Patrick, you spoke about we got a lot of data. We'll have to review the video. One point I'll make is that we also got a very strong theme running through about data in this uh, session. Uh, uh, Michelle uh, on the role of government in collecting data, but also on credible data. Nadia, uh, particularly from a youth perspective, and Alexia all again about uh, measurement, uh, the measurement point about data. Th that's a critical lesson uh, for us. We are doing some work on data collection, maybe not enough, um, uh, but uh, because it comes up to my answer to the question that was put to me, I would just say that on green data centers particularly, uh, we have done specific work. While the Energy Efficiency Directive has set uh, a target for climate neutral data centers by 2030, um, we are working already with our joint research center and industry to make sure that the measurement is credible. It has to be independent uh, and there have to be uh, um, uh, more detailed models. It's not just gross uh, power consumption, uh, it's, it's, it's gross and net. Uh, water consumption, etc. But I, I'm going to skip the rest. I was going to say about that point because I was asked the question by Michelle. Um, I, I'm going to interpret your question to mean uh, developments in digital with regard to green, uh, because it's an even wider question. And there, uh, the the first blunt response is, well, of course, we're 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 going to aim for our target, which is to ensure that ICT uh, moves towards carbon neutrality and contributes to other sectors. 
So you could even say that goal overrides market positioning or dominance. But of course, where those technical solutions or even any regulatory support for that objective, if they were to give rise to, give rise to bad outcomes, particularly with regard to dominance in, in society as much as in the market, well, that is something which in, in the European Union we have increasingly showed that we are willing to do the Digital Market Act, the Digital Services Act, in order to break down um, monopolies or duopolies in order to ensure the possibility to enter markets and also to ensure that solutions involve SMEs uh, and, and that we measure the impact of our work. And we should and will do the same and it cycles back to my point about data. The data doesn't just apply to the technology, it applies to the solutions and the implementation of those solutions to make sure that we are actually achieving our targets. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Piers. Thank you very much to all the speakers uh, online and here in the room. Uh, to all of you for joining us in the afternoon during the happy hour. So I really appreciate the, uh, the effort you have made. And with apologies to the uh, organizing team for spending some of the time in your preparations. Thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye.